happy Friday. How's everyone's Friday going? And where are you guys tuning in from? Hello, Autumn. Hello, Lori. There's Campbell. I'm just going to take a second and wait for Campbell to join us. So today we're talking about all things breathing with one of my favorite health practitioners, Campbell. He is a wealth of information and I can't wait to share all of his goodness with you. I'm just waiting for him to join. So this will be recorded if you cannot stay on the whole time. Um, point. All right, Campbell should be jumping on soon. Kansas City. Right. Hi, Campbell. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really, really well. Good. Thanks so much for taking the time to share your, your knowledge with us. I'm really excited to have a chat. I know every time we talk, we kind of dive down a few different rabbit holes. So I'm sure today won't be any different. I, I could talk about this for hours and hours. Are you in the smoke, Campbell, or are you in the clear? We're, it's still a little bit smoky today, so we're just outside of Philadelphia at the moment. Um, two days ago, it was kind of very apocalyptic, and it's kind of lessening, but air quality is still pretty yeah. average at best. Yeah, even I, I heard you talking about even more important to breathe through your nose during these times. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's important at the best of times, but with kind of everything that's in the air at the moment, I think it's no yeah. better time to kind of like recognize the importance of yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. All right, you guys, so for everyone joining, um, we're going to be talking all about breath work today, breathing. Campbell is a physiotherapist um, who specializes in breath work, mostly training other practitioners like myself um, to be able to use breath work as a tool to help clients heal. Um, I've taken a lot of certifications, a lot of different courses. I have a lot of different tools in my tool belt, but without proper breathing patterns, what I've found in my practice is that when it comes to healing the nervous system, which nervous system dysregulation is something I talk so much about because if the nervous system is stressed and we're in a constant state of fight or flight, it is really hard to heal. And chronic pain and chronic health issues are at an all time high. And it seems, I mean, it, I don't know what you're finding Campbell, but nervous system dysregulation is just a total epidemic. It seems everyone's struggling um, to, to spend more time and rest and repair and heal. So I had done, so many different things for my health. I had healed my gut and, you know, balanced my hormone, just done so many different healing protocols, but finally came to the conclusion that with a stressed nervous system, it doesn't matter how much you're doing those things if your nervous system is stuck in fight or flight. And the way that we breathe is either pulling the nervous system into fight or flight or toward rest and digest. Every breath we take, and I'll let Campbell get into this because he's the expert, but changing the way that we breathe has such an impact on our nervous system and so if you're struggling with chronic health issues whether it's depression anxiety pain autoimmune whatever you're here with learning how to breathe is so unbelievably important because it can be the difference between again every breath we take stressing your body or moving it toward a state of rest and repair um, so Campbell you always say something that I think is so unbelievably profound and I think about it almost every day because I feel it in my body all the time and that is the way that we breathe is the way that we do everything. Can you kind of unpack that for us? Yeah, I would love to. It's, you know, it's this really, even just as you're describing, you know, everything about the nervous system, we look at all of these different problems or different symptoms of problems and fail to recognize there's often this kind of common denominator, you know? And I think that kind of just goes against the way the medical system has been going for a while of like we have this specialist for this specific problem and this specific medication for this symptom yeah. and like the human body the human ecosystem doesn't really work like that and so the kind of the role that breath plays is this kind of piece that connects everything else and when we see and, and this is like what i love at the moment is kind of the science is kind of backing up and and really exploring some of these concepts like when we see a really busy brain activity, we see that reflected in the way someone's breathing. We see a really disrupted emotional state. We see that reflected in the way someone's breathing, right? We see posture, pain, like all of these different things. And so this idea that the way I'm breathing is the kind of the way I'm doing everything, right? It's how my brain is actually functioning. It's this state of my emotions, you know, my physical state, like, 
And so the beautiful part about this is it's a kind of bi-directional pathway, right? So everything I just described is saying breathing reflects my mind, it reflects my emotions, it reflects my body, but it also affects all of those things. Yeah. And that's an incredibly empowering piece of information, right? Because we are in charge of our breath. Yeah. And these small little lessons that I can learn of, oh, if I breathe like this, it impacts me that way. And if I change it like here, you know, and so these small, like, as soon as I start to make these little alterations and adjustments of my breathing, that's occurring 20, 25,000 times a day, we start to stack that, you know, accumulating effect of better breathing of more nervous system regulation of more balanced and coherent state of mind and body. And like you were saying before, it, it's kind of impossible to heal when the body is stuck in a survival state. You know, I, I often use the analogy, I've been using it quite a lot this week, that without the nervous system on board, you know, it's kind of trying to walk up the down escalator, right? Like the diet, the exercise, the, all those things will help move the needle, but you're still walking up the down escalator, you know? Yeah. Whereas kind of like what happens when we start to use something like breathing, and, and there's a lot of other strategies, and you talk a lot about them, that when we bring the nervous system back into harmony and congruence and coherence, you know, that escalator turns and all of a sudden I'm walking up the up escalator yeah. and progress starts to become a lot easier. Yeah. You know, instead of my health being a battle and a fight, you know, it starts to become this really like smooth journey. Yeah. And I, I think that's a completely different outlook that we can have. I know so many people that are fighting disease and fighting illness. And I just think that's that again, if we come back to the idea, of, that's the nervous yeah. system, you know, I'm in a sympathetic fight or flight. So I'm trying to fight the illness and yeah. fight the, instead of shifting into that kind of thrive state where I'm working towards health, it, it really is a, a very small difference, but I think an incredibly impactful one. Yeah, I do too. And for anyone listening, when I used to hear you talk about this Cambo, I was like, wow, this is so amazing. I, I can't wait to actually feel it. And after your breath work course, what I noticed is that having that breath awareness, how I was breathing was in direct correlation with how I felt. And if I wanted to feel differently, you gave us so many tools to change that state, whether I needed to just calm down, I wanted to feel more present, calm and peaceful, or if I was tired and I wanted to energize myself, but how we breathe is it's really how we, we feel. And that connection between our physiology and our psychology is something that I don't think a lot of people understand really well. So I want to talk a little bit about that and how the communication between between the mind and body. I talk so much about the mind and the body because when it comes to our physical, you know, chronic health issues, whatever it is, the mind plays such a powerful role. But, and I know you talk about this all the time, but 80% of the communication between the mind and the body is going from the body to the mind. And so the way that we breathe, our physiology is having a massive impact on the way that we think and the way that we feel. And I remember hearing you talk about this, Cam, I thought, wow, this is so powerful. But it wasn't until I really became so much more aware of how I was breathing that I could make that direct connection between no wonder I feel this way. No wonder I feel kind of jittery or I'm really reactive rather than taking that time between stimulus and response to choose, you know, that creating that space to be able to choose a different way of reacting so that I can grow and get a different outcome. So um, let's talk a little bit about how our physiology and breathing being such a big part of that impacts the way that we think and feel yeah so let's i'd love to take this in kind of two directions we'll start with the kind of more broad general overview but then i'd love to dive into some of the little bit more specific kind of science and physiology behind it because i think when people grasp that you know that one step deeper than just oh it impacts me this way it often is that catalyst for yeah i get that you know that does make sense so the first kind of point of when we're looking at breathing and physiology if we just look, you know, we all, we've probably all seen it, you know, it's a, a popular kind of statement or meme that we can go weeks without food, days without water, but only minutes without air. Yeah. And so that shows us the importance that breath plays in really survival. You know, we keep it just general. If I stop breathing, it's an immediate big problem. You know, my brain is going to go into this kind of survival state alarm, like, why aren't we breathing? And so my physiology is really dictated by my breathing. And, and the part of this that's very important is carbon dioxide, which we all breathe out, um, is acidic. You know, when it's in the blood, it's actually carbonic acid. And what that does is it regulates the pH of my blood. We all hear about alkaline being good and acidic being bad. And breathing is the fastest way to influence the pH of our blood. 
And where this gets, you know, a little bit more complex, but very, very interesting is our brain is incredibly sensitive to changes in pH because changes in pH dictate whether I can release oxygen to the cells or whether it's stuck in the blood. And how I'm breathing is really how much carbon dioxide am I retaining in my blood or am I blowing out with exhales? And the more that I retain, you know, it starts to change the pH. And then my brain is going to react and say, "Uh oh, is this good, bad? Like what's happening here? Change of pH, big alarm system. I want to kind of zoom in a little bit because this is really, really common with anxiety, right? There's this whole kind of phenomenon or, or system that they're looking at called uh, amygdala, sorry, anxiety induced apnea, right? Where I get a little bit anxious from something and my breathing either stops or changes. That change in my breathing causes a change in my chemistry, right? And it could have, the catalyst just, I was thinking of something scary. I have to do a presentation tomorrow and that thought triggers a physiological change. I stop breathing. The thought goes away, but now my brain's reacting to this change in my chemistry. Yeah. The pH is off. And that cycles because now I do feel really anxious, which causes me to breathe differently. And so we have this like, opportunity when we understand that to kind of get in front of these automatic kind of reactions that we often have of oh, I hold my breath on a little bit fright yeah. you know and that might be because a car whizzes by or it might be because I think of something yeah. that worries me you know which most of us do yeah. a lot exactly. <laughs> and so if that's happening you know on a pretty frequent basis there's this constant interruption of my physiology and my brain is always going to react to that, right? My brain doesn't kind of think, oh, well, it's just because you're worrying about the presentation tomorrow. You know, it says my chemistry is changing. Yeah. This is bad news. Yeah. And the correct response to that is get the system ready. Do we need to run away? Do we need to fight? And so there's this kind of hidden driver for a lot of people of their anxiety, of feeling stressed, of overwhelmed, of panicked. That's really physiology. It's not psychology, yeah. you know? We call anxiety a mental health issue. And then that just makes people think, well, it must be in my mind. But my mind is like you beautifully said, my mind is reflecting my body. My body's out of balance. And so of course my mind's gonna be like, oh God, what's going on? But we've forever, you know, for a while now, you know, decades if not more, we've been focusing on how do we manage the mind, right? How do we reduce anxiety through the lens of mental health? And that's cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy, medication right instead of why is my mind behaving with anxiety yes. because it's responding to the fact that my body's out of balance yes. and and that we control our physiology so we can kind of get in front of that bring physiology back to balance the mind just comes along for the ride you know it's like oh we're out of the danger cool we don't have to worry now yeah oh i love this information because it's so empowering like you said i think so many people that have struggled long term with anxiety just feel like they were dealt this bad hand and they have a you know mental health problem and they're going to have to be on medication and there's a time and a place for that but i think what a lot of the, the anxiety experts you're one of them campbell talks about is it's not a mental problem it's more coming from the body it's this alarm in the body it's this dysregulation of the physiology and that's creating this alarm in the brain and we think that it has everything to do with the way that we're thinking but when we calm our physiology it changes how we think. And I love that so much about, because it's empowering. I think so many people feel, you know, out of control and there's so many stressors that we're bombarded with. And a lot of times there's not a whole lot we can do about global pandemics and, you know, all of the things that are coming at us, but we can change the way we respond to them and almost trick our bodies into staying, you know, no matter what's happening, if you can breathe in a way that is signaling your body, hey, we're okay, we're safe, then we can be so much more resilient and handle stress so much better, which is just empowering. Yeah, I, I mean, I love this thread because what we, you know, we give so much power to our mind and failing to recognize that's one of the inputs for yeah. the nervous system, you know, so there's this concept of neuroception, which is like my nervous system's interpretation of the environment, external and internal. And we pay so much heed and mind to the mind. What are my thoughts, right? And so my nervous system is also listening to my breathing and my heart rhythms and the environmental information that's coming in. And so when I change those things, right, that's a much more powerful influence than changing my mind, right? I can say this is actually okay all I like, 
But if I'm still breathing like it's not okay, <laughs> that is the overriding information that my brain is going to receive, right? This little, like you said, the 20% of my mind saying it's okay, it's okay. It's, the 80% is saying it's not okay, right? Our physiology's off. We're breathing quickly. My heart's out of rack, right? And so instead of trying to use the mind to influence the body, I'm calm, I'm calm, I'm calm. And my body's saying, no, we're not. There's this kind of like, you know, it's not the back door. It's technically the front door because it's the main entrance. But if we change what the body's telling yeah. the mind, right? Because now I am breathing calmly. Now my physiology is in homeostasis or balance. Yeah. Again, like now that's the overriding input and I calm down, right? It's not because I convinced myself through yeah. mental thought patterns yeah. that I'm calm. It's because my body actually shifted gears and said, we're good. Yeah. We're actually okay now. Yeah. And, and that, changes really it's amazing when we look at brain activity now the part of my brain that i'm thinking from is different right it's less amygdala and it's more kind of the outsides in the front of the brain which is self-awareness and it's referential awareness and it's kind of you know my environment and it puts me back into i can make clearer decisions now while i'm stressed while i'm anxious instead of the kind of reactive anxiety driven decisions which all of us know you know we don't make great decisions when we're really stressed or we're really fearful it, it's just a, it's a different part of my brain making decisions yeah. no it's so true and it's just so empowering because again there's so much that is out of our control but we can control the way we respond and i would say breath is probably one of the most powerful you know tools that we have when it comes to yeah, this is stressful and there's a lot coming at me, but if we can breathe in a way that signals that safety and pulls the nervous system back into a state of safety, then it's just, we can handle so much more, which I think everyone's looking for a little more resilience in their life. Um, so Campbell, I wanna talk about, I wanna circle back around to the CO2 intolerance because I find it so interesting because when I do, you know, mini breath holds, um, you taught us how to do the bolt score, which is an amazing, just sort of a measurement of how your nervous system is doing. Um, I recently went through a really stressful time and I found that my bolt score just went down significantly and I could tell that um, I wasn't able to hold my breath as, as long. Can you talk a little bit about CO2 intolerance and its correlation with anxiety? And again, so many people just think I have a mental problem, but really it is probably a physiological problem and CO2 intolerance being a really huge part of that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've, you know, our little boy's kind of gone through a couple of weeks of really poor sleep, and I've noticed my CO2 tolerance out the window, yep. you know, like I'm not sleeping well. And now my body, my physiology is reflecting to me, we are not running on all cylinders, right? You haven't been sleeping well. And so instead of me kind of perceiving, or I use my aura ring or my whoop strap to tell me yes. how I'm doing, CO2 tolerance is this like in the moment reflection of how well my body is coping. Yep. And the way I really like to explain this, you know, we all have a window of tolerance. That window can be really narrow and I'm reactive and sensitive and anything can trigger me or that window is really broad and wide. And I can actually, you know, I have the resilience yeah. to take lots of stress on and I actually thrive and I move through it. And we've all experienced both of those circumstances where it's just like I'm taking everything in my stride and I'm just kind of moving forward or the slightest little thing is throwing me off right now. And Interestingly, if we measured someone's carbon dioxide tolerance in those two moments, we would see a correlation, right? When my CO2 tolerance is high, my buffer zone is really big. When my CO2 tolerance is low or I'm very sensitive, it's not going to take much to cross this threshold and my brain to interpret this as scary or bad. And so the kind of the idea here is that the more resilient or tolerant I am to physiological changes, then the more resilient and tolerant I'm going to be to physical changes and psychological changes and emotional changes and just the rest of the stuff that, that life throws at us. And so why I think that's really important is it's a very simple kind of test that we can do in ourselves. And it doesn't even need to be formal. You know, like you found, just my ability to hold my breath got trickier. And so people, you know, at moments of the day can kind of just pause their breathing. And if there's an immediate oh, flooring of I've got to get out, oh, okay, my tolerance is really low. Maybe I shouldn't go and do the high intensity yeah. workout. Yeah. Maybe I should go and meditate or do some yoga or walk in nature. You know, and if I can pause my breath and just hang out and it feels comfortable and it's like, okay, my body's telling me my buffer zone's pretty big right now. So go and do the hard thing. You know, you've got kind of the green light from the body. And I think that as a tool for kind of self-awareness is incredibly impactful because Coming back to, you know, 
what this conversation, you know, resides around is the nervous system. I know so many people that are trying to get themselves into, you know, a healing state, but go and do an intense workout or a breathing through their mouth or, you know, are pushing their physiology beyond its capacity right now. And that's just another form of stress that I have to then react to and, and try and recover from. And so having this kind of like personal gauge of should I go hard or should I just ease yeah. off today based on what my body's telling me? Um, I think it, it just really puts people into that position of I can choose the thing that's going to benefit yeah. me most today. Yeah. Oh, it's so unbelievably powerful because I mean, if we don't know, I know for me, I measured heart rate variability for a really long time. You know, you wake up, how's my heart rate variability? Should I push this workout? How's my nervous system? Am I run down? It's such a great, but I feel like the bolt score and just like you said, a mini breath hold and just sort of testing, how am I doing today? And you'll know right away. If you go into like that immediate major air hunger and you feel your heart start, it's like, okay, so yeah, I need to. And you taught me this too, Campbell. You know, if, if you are there and you've been sleeping poorly, you feel like your system is a little more stressed um, and you, you still want to do your workout, can you breathe through your nose during this workout and keep your body more in that parasympathetic state rather than going, well, I'm hyperventilating, I didn't sleep, I'm really stressed out, but I'm going to go do this HIIT workout and breathe through my mouth, which pulls the body into more of a sympathetic fight or flight state. So it is such a powerful tool. And I think once we understand that, Stress really is the reason that we get sick, the main reason, and it's also the main reason that we stay sick. And so, again, the way that we breathe, it's just so, how many breaths, Campbell? Is it 20,000 breaths on average? Most, most people about 22, actually, most people probably a little more bit than, more these days, We're closer to 25,000 every day. 25,000 breaths, so such a powerful tool to, wow, I had a poor night's sleep, just being aware of your breathing that next day can pull your body out of that sympathetic state and back into a parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system. It is, again, I think it is the most powerful tool I have just in my own, you know, my own, just practicing my own stuff. But it's, it's one of those things that I think a lot of people get into. I know I did several years ago and we expect to have like these immediate results. You know, we do one breath work, you know, session in the morning and we feel great and that's amazing. But Campbell, you talk so much about this in your certification. It's taking that awareness of your breath into your day that for me was what was so unbelievably transformative because we can all practice 10 minutes of box breathing or coherent, whatever it is, whatever you like to do. But if, if that's all we're doing and then we're going throughout our day, breathing through our mouth, breathing shallow, you know, again, we're pulling, it's not, it's not going to balance out your system. It's not, it's not going to be enough to really move the needle. But if you can take that awareness into your day with you, and understand that if you can alter the way you're breathing, you can alter the way you think and the way you feel. And then that starts to, you know, then you think and feel in more of a calm and present state. And then you even start to breathe even better. And it's just this whole cycle that is so powerful once you tap into it. Um, so yeah, right. like it can either be this kind of like upward yeah. spiral, yes. right? That one thing precedes the next and they're all kind of pushing me or it can be a downward spiral. And that downward spiral, I think, is what most people experience, right? When a thought pops into my head, you know, or a memory of that thing that happened that was kind of traumatic, which then alters the way that I breathe. We know that, you know, everyone, that's, that's not a kind of uncommon thing. It's just the natural cause of my breathing is responding to this thought. But then that alteration of my physiology sends a signal through my nervous system to say something could be off. And then I'm kind of stuck in thinking, of well that other thing that happened right and down this spiral we go and what you're talking about with breath awareness and you beautifully articulate it right from breathing and then from what i'm thinking and then from how i'm feeling it's kind of like once i notice my breath i do notice all of the other things that are pushing me in a certain direction i notice my breath and then i notice i'm clenching my jaw and i didn't notice that before right it's only since i've kind of pulled my attention to my breathing Oh, my jaws clench. My shoulders are up by my ears, right? I'm holding my body really rigidly. And so as I kind of undo each of these things that have only become evident to me because of breath awareness, you know, like I've noticed this kind of like intersection between what's going on in my body and what I'm experiencing. So I notice breathing. Oh, wait, I'm holding my breath. And then I start breathing at my jaw and I unclench my jaw and my shoulders drop. And then the racing thoughts start to slow down. And all of a sudden that spiral's going up, you know, and these tiny little interventions have 
stacked on top of each other, you know, so with this cumulative kind of exponential effect that all of a sudden I'm pulled out of that state of anxiety or panic and I'm actually feeling like I'm back in control here. But we miss all of those things if we don't have the breathing piece. That's the one part of us, you know, and, and this is this really interesting paradox. It's both automatic and it's also under our control. It's the only function of the body that behaves like that. And I always like to play this kind of trick on people, but there's this difference between awareness and perception, right? Perception, I'm perceiving stuff all the time, right? No one right now can feel clothing touching their skin until I just said that, right? Everyone's now like, wait, there's my t-shirt, you know? My awareness met my perception. You were feeling your t-shirt all the time. It's just not important information to your brain, so it just blanks it out. And so breathing is the same way. Unless my breathing gets really, my body is just like, this happens 25,000 times a day. It's pretty, you know, monotonous. I'm going to focus on other things. And so when I pull my awareness to meet my perception of my breathing, of my posture, of the tension in my body, of the thoughts in my mind, it just gets me back into, do I want to hold my body like that? Should I be clenching my jaw? Do I want to be thinking these thoughts? But we had to use the awareness to get into, oh, wait, I am doing these things that I wasn't aware of a moment ago. Oh, it's so powerful. And that self-awareness too is really the precursor to healing and growth in so many ways. Because if we can't observe what we're doing or who we are being, then how are we ever going to change what we're doing and who we're being and get a different result, be able to heal or achieve whatever goal we're after. Um, there's so much talk to Campbell about healing trauma. And something I've learned from you is it's so you know, I think so many people are, you know, they're talking about their trauma and they're going back and they're reliving and they're hashing it out and thinking that that might be what helps them heal. But trauma really is, is what happens to the body. That's the part, in my opinion, that keeps us from healing most is when we experience a trauma or a massive stressor, it changes our physiology during that, you know, whatever happened to you, we breathe, we start to breathe differently because of that stressor. And a lot of people experience those stressors at you know six years old it changes their breathing at that point in their development and they really never learn to correct those patterns and so here they are stuck in a state of fight or flight talking about their problems talking about trauma there's a time and a place for talk therapy for sure but if you want to heal from trauma you have to heal what trauma has done to the body and to change the physiology in the body for me that was so big because you know i've done a lot of therapy and talk and you know you go back and you rehash and you learn why you are the way you are but it's really what trauma has done to your physiology if you want to make that massive shift and heal what has happened physiologically so um, it's just again another powerful tool i honestly just got kind of chills when you said you know you have to heal what trauma does to your body like, I don't know, I've never even heard it phrased so succinctly like that. But I, I want to kind of show an example that I work with so many adults with really, really bad anxiety that had childhood asthma, that had a near, you know, I actually either had to get intubated or I had a big asthma attack that I was rushed to the hospital and I thought I was going to die. Very traumatic. And so like exactly just beautifully articulated, right? What I'm thinking and how I'm talking about that 20, 30, 40 years later is far less important than how did my body begin to compensate and respond to that experience that happened when I was seven years old, right? My physiology changes, my breathing pattern changes, how I hold my body, my expectation, my association with, as my physiology changes, my brain is immediately going to, is this like that time I nearly died? right? Turn on the anxiety alarm. Yep. We need to be ready. You know, it's a survival mechanism. And so we can kind of talk about that as much as we like. And I think it is very important to be able to contextualize and articulate it. But if we don't unravel and undo what happened to the body in response to that experience, then again, we're kind of walking up the down escalator. You know, my body is stuck in that protective, let's phrase it as it is, you know, it's not a dysfunction. It's a you know, it's a protective mechanism that's got a little bit out of whack, you know, because it's been built on for decades. Yeah. So that recognition of I changed my breathing when that happened and my breathing has forever been different yeah. and that's been impacting me cumulatively up until today. Yeah. And the recognition of that and the, the intellectual side of that is not enough to change the patterns no. that I develop. So I have to get in there and I have to, change the way I use my diaphragm and I have to change my chemistry and I have to change how my nervous system responds. And what I think is most important 
is I have to change how my brain interprets this change in my breathing. Because if it continues to remember that time that I felt like I nearly died, it will continue to sound the alarm. At the slightest change, it'll go, we don't want to die, so we need to act right now. And I think that is the big catalyst for people of, wait, you know, like like using the breath holding example, when I work with people that have had, you know, near drownings or the childhood asthma or the severe anxiety, they hold their breath and immediately the mind goes to, it felt like I was going to drown or suffocate or have an anxiety attack. So it's the association that my brain makes that's really the problem. And if we can separate those things, my physiology, which is a benign kind of innocuous change and how my brain interprets it, am I going to die or is it just my physiology changing? Right. That's where this kind of work, I think, really, really makes impact. Yeah, it's so powerful. Now, I, you just gave me the chills because, again, I think so many people, you know, there's just a stigma with mental health issues. And, and I, I'm just an anxious person. And I just have social anxiety. And I just I'm just I'm not able to take much on. I don't have any capacity. I'm not resilient. And it's like, hold on. If you change your physiology, you could be. And I think so many people don't understand that when we go through these stressors, when we go through this trauma, it changes our physiology. And honestly, until we become aware of that and then heal and change our, we're not gonna make that connection between our physiology and our psychology, how, you know, what's going on here um, versus how we're thinking and feeling. And I talked so much about too, and and Campbell, you had an awesome video on this yesterday. Um, When it comes to healing, who we're being, the state that we're in is so much more important than all of the things we're doing. And I think so many of us are trying to do this protocol and that, and I'm healing my gut and my hormones and all of these different things. Um, But who you're being, right, your thoughts and your feelings and your physiology while you're doing those things is so much more important than what you're doing. So again, since having this knowledge after taking your breathwork course, Campbell, I will watch so many different health practitioners, big health influencers. And it's so fascinating to watch. They're living these really healthy lifestyles. They're doing all the things that were, you know, sauna and all the different things that we talk about today. But the whole time they're doing them, their their physiology, you can tell by the way that they're breathing, the way that they're moving through, who they're being is moving their body into that state of dysregulation. And I just don't think enough people understand that and make that connection. who we're being, you know, the body's always reflecting who we're being and our breath is such a big part of that because it has such a massive influence on the way that we think and feel. Um, I, I think it's, it can be really frustrating to try to just be positive and change the way you think and change the way you feel. Maybe don't try to do that. Maybe just change your breath and allow that to change the way that you think and feel because it absolutely does. Right. And it, you know, it's so amazing. We could take a intervention or a protocol or a practice or a tool and the way in which I do it dictates whether it's good or bad for me. Right. And I, and I think I, I actually learned this from one of your posts, you know, like, are you doing something out of love or fear? You know, are you exercising because you love your body? Or are you exercising because you hate the way you look? Exercise is not good for you if you're doing it out of fear. And I hate, you know, but the exact same thing, moving my body and lifting some weights or whatever it might be, done with intention of I'm doing this because I love how I want to feel, right? And I love my body, like completely different response. And it's so, to me, like this is where I'm really obsessed at the moment. And there's this research coming out, you know, between, behind like how our perspective shifts our biology, right? Do I think something's good for me or bad for me? And we could talk the stress, the most area, the kind of biggest area of study on this is stress, right? If I think stress is bad, it literally, increases my chances of mortality. But people that had more stress that perceived it as good had an increase, right, in their length of life and longevity. And so lower stress, but I think it's really bad for me, will kill us sooner than high stress that I'm like, this is going to cause me to grow. And that's only perception. You know, that's only what stories I tell myself about the stressful thing that's happening. It's not, you know, genetics. It's not my hormones. It's not the body or the hand that I was dealt. It's how I choose to interpret the thing. And whether that's stress or whether that's exercise or whether that's the food I eat or the glass of water I drink, you know, like imagine the the changes in my biology when I take a glass of water and I let sunlight hit it and I fill it with intention. I understand this is going to hydrate the 30 trillion cells in my body. And I, you know, versus like I just turn the tap on and chug down. Oh, the doctor told me to drink some water, you know? 
there's just water going into your body, but I guarantee there's a huge difference in the kind of biological response to both of those actions. And it's back to intention. And this kind of really nicely ties into placebo effect, you know? That's what the placebo effect is. It's belief that something I'm doing is good for me. And that's all it's required to outperform all of the pharmaceutical studies. It's like, I believe this sugar pill is going to help me, right? And it does yeah. because I believed it so truly, you know, and so strongly. And that kind of is the, the catalyst, I think, for like, how do I take the mundane and turn it into something that is just truly beneficial for my body? Yeah. It's I got to believe it's good and I've got to put some intention behind it's it. It's so powerful. I talk so much about how our belief. I'm sure you've heard of the book, The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. But I mean, like you're saying, Campbell, it is proven by science that the way that we think, what we believe is having a direct impact on the outcome in our life. Our, our life is really a reflection of what we do believe. But I think so. when I say that, I think so many people feel disempowered because naturally they feel like their, their thinking is more fear-based, more worst case scenario, more how do I believe that I can heal? How do I believe in all this, you know, quote, positive stuff when that's not how I'm thinking and how I'm feeling? But they, they think it's because of how they think and feel. But really, again, when your physiology is dysregulated, that's influencing the way that you think and feel. So maybe you're not just an anxious person or just a fear-based catastrophizer, whatever you've called yourself. Maybe your physiology is just so dysregulated that it's created that way of thinking. You're stuck in that state of survival and your thinking is equal to your physiology. It's just, again, it's so, so powerful. I wish there was a million more Campbells on this planet. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, you know, one thing I, I just am enamored by in your work and that what you do and that you share, you know, is that there is no separation between mind and body, you know? And it, it's been such a shame for medicine and just, the, the general well-being of the world, you know, that we've created this, oh, I'm like, it's my mind and not my body. Instead of like, this is just two sides of the same coin, yeah. you know, and it's something that I think we so, we're very reductionist in our understanding of things. The mind is mental and it's up here and it's conjugate, you know, instead of like, okay, if I just look, you know, lens of the nervous system again, when my body is in a survival state, you know, sympathetic arousal, anxiety, of course, my mind is not going to be like chill and happy and looking for positivity. You know, my body's saying we are under attack. There's something threatening happening. We might not survive. That's not the time and place for positive no. thinking, you know, no. evolutionarily. And so I think so many people get stuck in this, like I must be broken, right? Because I can't think positive. Well, if you try and keep changing your thoughts without addressing the state that you're in you will feel like you're broken you're just like you know i try it for five seconds and i'm positive and then all of the stuff comes rushing back because my body's still freaking out right my body still thinks it's under attack and it's like what are you doing trying to pay attention to like the things that you're grateful for we're just trying to survive here you know and it wrenches the mind back to its appropriate state of my nervous system's up here my mind is up here and so for the people that feel like i struggle to have positive thoughts or I struggle to feel positive emotions. Let's kind of just look at, well, is my body, you know, are the need, needs of my nervous system and body being met? Because positive emotion and positive thinking is, is not very high no. on the hierarchy of staying alive. You know, it's an added benefit. <laughs> like that will happen when I'm in a state of safety and comfort and connection. It's like, it's very easy to be positive when your needs are being met and your nervous system's regulated, it's harmonious. So, you know, for so long, I think we've tried to battle the mind in a way, instead of seeing my mind is just reflecting my state and I can impact my state, you know, through time in nature, through my breathing, through my posture, through social connection and just a conversation with someone that I love or that loves me or my dog, you know, like these things that inherently change our state in the moment it makes it really hard to have negative thoughts when you're in a positive state. And so like kind of coming at it from that side, I think can be really beneficial for the people that do, you know, that I've always been an anxious person or I, I can't seem to get a hold of my thoughts. Let's try and maybe look at the nervous system as one of the influences on how you're feeling and thinking. Yeah. I think it is one of the most powerful influences. I've, I've just noticed that in my own life where, it, how I'm breathing is exactly how I'm feeling. And if I want to feel different, I have to change the way that I'm breathing. It's just so powerful. Okay, so for everyone listening, they're probably wanting to know, well then, am I breathing right? 
am I breathing in a way that is causing this anxiety, this fear-based thinking? Campbell, what are some of the most common signs that you look for when you are identifying whether or not someone is breathing properly? Yes. So I always like to, you know, we can look through the kind of subjective lens and we can also look through the more objective lens. And subjectively, you know, it's waking up feeling tired. It's reactivity. It's I feel like I don't have a lot of tolerance to stressful things. You know, it's kind of that feeling of jumpiness or readiness. The objective side is maybe I do notice my mouth's open sometimes. I sigh pretty frequently. <sighs> Right. What I'm doing is trying to regulate my physiology there. Some other people, it's yawning. I'm yawning all the time. One of the really big ones, uh, particularly for those people that do suffer from a bit of anxiety or even stress, is this feeling like I can't take a deep breath. Yes. You know, maybe they've tried breath and it just feels like I can't get a breath in. You know, what's most interesting about that is we're typically describing our physiology. It might feel very physical. I feel like I can't take a breath in. My body feels claustrophobic and tight, but that's again, my interpretation of physiology often. And so the most common things that I tend to see, you know, are related to someone's posture. It's very hard to breathe slow, deep and optimally when my shoulders are rounded and my diaphragms all crunched down in my belly. So posture can be a big driver. Pain can also be a big driver, particularly back and neck pain, right? It hurts your low back if you take a really deep breath and your back is sensitive. Yeah. So you learn not to, right? And I'll take shallow breaths in my chest because that doesn't hurt. And then the final one, which we've kind of spoken about today, is really the state that I'm in, right? My breathing is reflecting. So if I'm breathing quickly, is it because I'm feeling stressed? And vice versa, you know, is my breathing quickly actually the thing that's making me feel stressed? And so for the people kind of checking in with themselves of, do I breathe well, you know, is, well, do I sigh often? Do I feel like I can't take a deep breath in? Do I perhaps tend to run a little bit snappy and reactive sometimes? Um, and maybe I'm noticing, you know, that I don't notice my breath yeah. at all. Um, that's often a, a sign as well of like understanding is my breath a driver of these things as well. Do you notice how you're breathing in any of these states? Yeah, just learning how to observe how you're breathing was so eye-opening for me. Again, when you finally tune into your breath, we you can kind of make that connection. Well, no wonder this is why I'm feeling this way. And it's so powerful because if you want to feel different, you can just change the way you're breathing. So when you're watching someone breathe, Campbell, and you're, you know, you're looking at their mechanics, what are you looking at? Um, you know, when you watch someone, what are the things that you're looking at as far as dysfunctional breathing mechanics goes? So the easiest way we can all kind of conceptualize this um, is if I had a cup, right? And I was going to fill that cup with water. What would happen is the water would fall down to the base of the cup. It would then kind of expand to fill the sides and then it would rise to the top, right? So the key part of that is the top of the cup fills right at the end. If I'm watching someone breathe and at the start of their breath, I'm noticing the top of the cup's filling up, right? My shoulders are rising, but at the start, what that means is I'm using muscles that elevate my rib cage, right? For those of us that aren't too aware of the diaphragm, it's right down here, right? The diaphragm that's positioned down in the middle of my thorax, right, does not have the ability to lift up my shoulders. It just can't, you know, it's in the wrong position. Something below can't lift up. And so if I'm seeing this kind of movement up and down, we know immediately, okay, you're using some of your kind of accessory respiratory muscles. So we have some muscles that come from the top of the neck down onto the second and third ribs and first rib, and they kind of like pick the rib cage up. And if I take a really kind of stressful breath, you'll see these muscles, right? Kind of picking my rib cage up. But that's because I'm, you know, I'm intentionally showing people like, but if that's happening at rest 25,000 times a day, what is that telling my nervous system? It's telling my nervous system, there are predators around, we should be running away, we need to fight, you know, it's this constant signal. And so this kind of vertical movement instead of a more horizontal movement or 360 degree kind of expansion, we shouldn't necessarily see the collarbones and the shoulders rising, we should see the bottom of the rib cage expanding the belly and the back expanding, right? The breath moving down into the pelvic floor. That's where we're meant to be breathing. This up here, this is reserved for emergencies. You know, this is, right? Like everyone, if you've gone really hard exercise, show me how you breathe. 
right? Because that's my sympathetic nervous system, recruiting these muscles that say, let's just pick the rib cage up a little bit because path of least resistance, I'm going to pull some air in really quickly because we need to move air. Something's happening. Versus at rest, you know, this slow filling of the bottom of the cup, the bottom of my lungs where all of the blood flow is, where all of the alveoli are, you know, it sends a completely different signal through my nervous system to say, we're either in a dire situation or we're actually very calm, safe and supported. Yeah. And so even though we're just talking about the mechanics of breath here, again, how does my nervous system interpret? My shoulders going up and down or my diaphragm contracting? stimulating my vagus nerve expanding the abdominal contents right they're two really different messages and it's just mechanics right we haven't even talked about what that does to physiology or anything else but just the way i'm breathing tells my brain what situation am i in what environment am i in right now yeah do i need to be heightened alert anxious attentive or can i be soft and creative and empathetic and connected you know yeah but that shift alone is enough to you know you talk about in your course a lot campbell how when we activate the diaphragm, we stimulate the vagus nerve. And there's so much talk about the vagus nerve right now because if we can stimulate it, it does move the body into that parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system. So, so many people, again, are breathing sort of from here up and they're never getting that movement in their diaphragm, therefore never stimulating the vagus nerve. And so they get poor vagal nerve tone or nervous system dysregulation or chronic stress or whatever you want to call it. So just changing that part of your mechanics. And again, it's not something you go, oh, good idea. And you just master <laughs> once. It's cumulative. The benefits are so cumulative. And you'll find that if you're in a stressful situation, you'll find you start to breathe more from here up. But again, as soon as you have that awareness, if you can shift to that more horizontal breath, it is so powerful. It's just so powerful. Yeah, I want to zoom in on something here because I think it's incredibly important and incredibly misunderstood. This idea that, you know, so if I just, let's take you as an example. If I just said, oh, you know, long exhales stimulate the vagus nerve and calm you down. I want you to do a three second inhale and a six second exhale. If you do that without recruiting your diaphragm, your vagus nerve isn't getting touched, right? And so again, people feel like, What's wrong with me? Why doesn't this breath practice calm me down? And it said vagus nerve, parasympathetic, and it doesn't. It's because I'm doing that inhale and exhale without actually moving yeah. my diaphragm. You know, the part of the breath that stimulates the vagus nerve is the dissension and ascension of the diaphragm, right? The vagus nerve goes through a hole in the diaphragm. And so when the diaphragm moves up and down, it stimulates the vagus nerve and sends a message to the brain that we're breathing down here, we're good. And so it doesn't often matter what the breath practice is if I do it yeah. wrong, you know? And I think so many people get taught, you know, box breathing or extended exhales or one, two ratio breathing, and they're doing it with improper mechanics and they're wondering why it doesn't help. In fact, it makes them feel more stressed and more anxious because now they've taking a deeper breath and a longer breath with poor mechanics. Yeah. And it just doesn't give breathing the opportunity to do what we're all told no. it does. And again, we think, oh, well, this doesn't work for me. What's the next thing? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's why mechanics are so important because again, I think, you know, we've all heard somebody say, you know, if you're really stressed out or something horrible just happened, you take a deep breath. But if we don't have good mechanics, <laughs> no one's gonna do it. It's like fuel on the fire, honestly, you know, take a deep breath for people that don't technically know how to take a good breath yeah. is literally like crank it up, yeah. you know, like turn it up the volume on what I mean. <sighs> Wait a minute. Why don't I feel more calm is because I took a breath that said we are stressed yeah. and now we're more stressed. This is so important though, because so many people hear that, you know, breath work is so important and it's going to help you heal and calm your nervous system. And they start to, you know, they start with a practice. Maybe it is box breathing or two X breathing or whatever it is, but, it's going to make you feel worse if you're not, if your mechanics are not, are not right. So Campbell, what else? Looking at somebody, you're watching to breathe, they're, they're moving up and down. So we want to take more of a horizontal breath for anyone that's just jumping on. What else? The next one would be, you know, if I can hear someone breathing, I know there's a problem, right? And problems may be a strong word, but I know something's not right. There's this kind of beautiful proverb uh, from Thich Nhat Hanh, like the way he said it was like the way a human should breathe is though they're not breathing at all. 
you know, and here's this wonderful kind of master back in, I'm not sure what century, but there's also, and I, you know, I always think when we see examples of this through different cultures at different times, it must be important. Um, and there's this story of, you know, how they used to pick samurais in Japan is they would hold a feather under their nostrils. And if there was movement of the little feather of the hairs on the feather, they weren't ready. Right. So again, they're breathing like they're not breathing at all. And so breathing should be really, really subtle. It should be silent. It shouldn't be obvious at all. So like right now, I can't see your body moving. I can't hear anything. Your mouth, like, I don't know if you're holding your breath or breathing, right? That's what it should be. And so, you know, for people listening, if you can hear your partner breathing on the couch, right? Like that is the sign of a body that's kind of laboring to just get air in and out, right? Why is it doing that? We're, we're not in a, a demanding situation right now. If you can hear your own breath, it's often a sign that you're kind of over breathing. Yeah. And what I think is really important to understand is I try and shy away from good breathing and bad breathing because what are you doing? Are you running up a hill or are you sitting on the couch? Or are you playing with your kids or are you lifting a weight in the gym? You know, so when we say good breathing is this and bad breathing is this, people think breathing has to be this static yeah. thing, yeah. you know? What I think good breathing is it's adaptable, it's flexible, it's versatile, you know, but generally it should be silent. It should be really subtle and it should be really soft, yeah. right? So kind of number one is what part of my body is moving and number two is can I hear it? Is it obvious? It yeah. should be very, very subtle. Yeah, it's amazing how many people you will, when you start to become aware of this stuff, how many people you can just hear breathing, like really, really, and it's the body, the heart, everything has to work so much harder, I think, you know, high blood pressure is a total epidemic and everyone's getting on blood pressure medication. But if we were breathing better, <laughs> let's talk about that. Um, Campbell, let's jump into just- Let's, what, that, the, let's definitely talk about let's, that. <laughs> let's talk about breathing through the nose and nitric oxide and the benefits of nitric oxide because again, oh my gosh, the body, like we have so many, if we can just learn how to use this tool it is so powerful. We don't have to rely on all of the drugs and protocols and we can just use our bodies to heal. Yeah. You know, and so when we breathe in through our nose, we have the paranasal sinuses. So para just meaning next to. So we've got sinuses on either side of the nose, just behind the forehead. The lining of these sinuses produces a molecule called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is incredibly interesting. You know, in fact, interesting doesn't even, you know, it comes very short. It's just wondrous. Yeah. It's antibacterial, it's antimicrobial, it's antiviral. When it gets into my blood and into my body, it relaxes my airways and my blood vessels, right? So what nitric oxide is, is a vasodilator, which means it relaxes my blood vessels, right? And so if we just use the example of blood pressure, right? If I've got pipes that are a certain diameter, right? And it's gonna take a certain amount of pressure to push fluid through that pipe. If the pipe gets bigger and more flexible, it takes less pressure to move fluid through that pipe. So what nitric oxide does and what carbon dioxide also does is it actually relaxes the 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels that we have in our body, right? The pressure that my heart is beating at and required to move blood through my body and oxygenate my tissue is dependent on how tight those pipes are. And so nasal breathing, Number one, it you know, cleans the air and it makes sure that nothing that shouldn't be in my body gets into my body. But number two, it kind of prepares the body for the oxygen that's coming in by relaxing and opening the blood vessels and the airways. So I can actually take the oxygen, you know, which is the thing that sustains life in our body and use it. And use it from the tips of my toes to the crown of my head because my circulatory system is dynamic and flexible and, and responsive to the air that's coming in. Yeah. I can just imagine how many people who are on, you know, blood pressure medication It'd be so fun to see. And soon I'm sure there will be studies, but you know, just people learning how to breathe properly, because again, our bodies are so smart. They don't make mistakes. We don't have a deficiency in, you know, blood pressure mode. You know, we don't, we don't need these medications if we can use our bodies properly oftentimes. So um, I love that. So Campbell, when you're breathing through your nose and you're producing nitric oxide, I, I got a lot of questions about, is it okay to exhale through the mouth if I don't like to exhale through my nose? Is it mostly that we want to inhale through the nose? Do we want to exhale through the nose or can we exhale through the mouth? So 
if we kind of went through like a hierarchy, so best would be nasal inhales and nasal exhales, yeah. right? So we're breathing 100% of the time in and out of the nose. If we kind of differentiate between, well, what's more important, right? Nasal inhale, definitely, because that is, you know, there is just tons of microbes and pathogens and stuff in the air that we can't see, that if it's coming in through my mouth, it's getting straight into my lungs. My lungs actually have these tiny little hairs called cilia that then are kind of working and producing mucus to get that stuff out, right? So people that are congested and coughing, right? Probably because you're breathing in pathogens and dust and microbes into the lungs and then the lungs are like, oh, got to get this out. So when I'm breathing through the nose, you know, it kind of like prevents all of that accumulation of stuff coming in. Yeah. But the, the part of it, and this is actually taken from a study just to explain the importance of when they have people that are intubated, you know, so that they're on a machine that's breathing for them. When the air is coming in through the intubation, they measured how much the oxygen is being transported to the tissues. And then they just created this little pipe that went from the nasal cavity into the airway. And they saw 18% more oxygenation at the tissue, you know, and there's these fields of thought that absence of oxygen is presence yeah. of disease. Yes. And so what does 20% more oxygenation do for your body? You know, it, it, it's almost unfathomable to consider. It's like, oh, like 20% more fuel for my cells, yeah. right? And so I think just that idea of, well, yes, bringing this in and what it does, whether it's just the humidity of the air, uh, the purification of the air, how my body starts to kind of respond to the breath that's coming in and what it does. Um, but it's also nitric oxide is like a signaling, signaling molecule in the brain. And so it behaves like a neurotransmitter. And so there's like, you know, these threads that come off this molecule that's only produced in the nose, right? It's not produced in the mouth cavity. Um, we can produce nitric oxide in the vessels of the blood, like the blood vessels, they can release systemic nitric oxide too, but the main source of it comes from our sinus. It's amazing. And you just said, I think I heard, um, Gary Brecka, are you familiar with him, Campbell? He's a leader. Yeah. And he said the other day, he was on stage and he said, yeah, the absence of, or the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. And it, it, that's simple, but it's also so true. It's so true. And I think if we understood that, again, we could feel empowered because there's so many people, there's so many people listening that have done so many different things to improve their health, but they're nowhere near where they want to be and your breathing is probably the missing link. It is most often um, with my clients. So um, yeah, so for anyone just jumping on, we wanna take a more of a horizontal breath. Diaphragm kind of sits right around the rib cage, right below the rib cage. Wanna breathe through the nose, ideally exhale through the nose as well. And just being aware of, again, that breath awareness thing. If you're not talking and you're going about your day, is your mouth open or closed? You know, I, I consider myself a nose breather because I breathe through my nose at night. Um, but is my mouth closed during the day? Not always, you know, it's really interesting. It is. And and coming back to kind of the, the nose or mouth exhale, for the people that say I don't, it's not as comfortable to breathe out of my nose or it doesn't feel as good to breathe out of my nose. Again, what they're describing is I don't like the feeling of carbon dioxide accumulating, right? So said another way, I'm a little bit sensitive to my physiology, to the accumulation of CO2. So when I open my mouth, I can breathe out the carbon dioxide a lot easier, right? I can just move more volume of air. So when we're talking about, is it better one or the other, when I'm breathing out through my nose, I'm retaining some of that carbon dioxide, which is very, very important. One, for the sensitivity and the pH of my brain, right? Two, my association with the feeling of my physiology changing. Yeah. But three, carbon dioxide, you know, facilitates the movement of oxygen from blood to the mitochondria, to the cells. And so if I'm always offloading the carbon dioxide, what happens is the oxygen just stays in my blood, you know? and I have this big kind of bugaboo because I often get referred patients from cardiologists and pulmonologists and they always say, well, they checked my blood saturation, my oxygen saturation. You know, they put the little monitor on, they said, my oxygen saturation is fine. But what that's measuring is how much oxygen is in my blood. That doesn't do anything for us, right? We need the oxygen to be in our mitochondria of our cells. That's where we produce ATP or energy. And so what allows the oxygen to move from my blood into the cell is carbon dioxide, you know? Yeah. It's this really, and I know this is maybe a little bit over people's some heads when we're looking at respiratory physiology, but you know, we have 
oxygen and it's being carried around by the red blood cell, carbon dioxide kind of comes along and it bumps it off and it forces it into a cell and then it takes its spot and goes back to the lungs so we can breathe it out. But if we're forever breathing out from our mouth, you know, I keep expelling the CO2 and my oxygen stays stuck in the blood. And so we have this kind of local tissue hypoxia, which just means less oxygen. And kind of according to, again, people like Gary Brecker, then that absence of oxygen allows for the presence of disease, right? Because now my cell is accumulating lactic acid because it doesn't have yeah. oxygen to run the little machinery and it has to go through backup, which is kind of a different energy cycle and it produces lactic acid and metabolites that start to build up and change the pH of the cell. And, you know, we can go down that pathway, but if I don't retain enough CO2, I don't deliver as much oxygen. Yeah. So when we breathe out through the nose, we kind of hold some of the CO2 back. This is so important because I think most of us learned in school, at least I did, that CO2 is bad. Yeah, waste. <laughs> the bad waste product. And so you just want to exhale a lot and take deep breaths and blow it all out. But um, we're, we're over exhaling. We're actually hyperventilating, which is causing, you know, like, like you just said, Campbell, you have to have that CO2 to carry the oxygen into the blood. Like to be able to use the oxygen, we need that CO2. Um, I want to talk a little bit about low energy. I think a lot of people struggle with low energy. And again, don't make that connection between the way they're breathing and their level of energy. Um, I heard Gary Brecker say the other day, I know you know a lot about this too, Campbell, that so in the cell, we have the mitochondria, which is where ATP, which is energy, is made and every time i think you explained it sort of like a ferris wheel every time we get this cycle of the krebs cycle where we're making atp we're making energy we can make with each cycle we can make anywhere from two to 32 units of energy and what dictates how much energy we're making is the presence of oxygen and so so many of us are so low but it's because the way that we're breathing is influencing how much ATP, how much energy our body can actually produce. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'd rather produce 32 units of energy per breath than, you know, than two. So again, using our breath to alter our physiology and, and the more oxygen we have, healthier our pH, our immune, I mean, our nervous, it's it just that the list is endless. And so once again, I think we're looking for health solutions and, you know, we have low energy. Well, I must have a vitamin deficiency. I must have, but when we correct our physiology, our body knows exactly how to heal. Yeah, like, you know, coming back where we're talking, where we've become a little bit reductionist, you know, like mental is mind, but because of something like a calorie, we're like energy food, yeah. you know, maybe I'm not breaking down my food or maybe I'm not eating the right things or maybe I need to supplement with this, but energy, you know, yeah. is really just like my cells produce energy. And, and we're not talking about, you know, sugars versus, like it's ATP. It, it's the molecule that my body really runs on. And everything is broken down eventually so it can produce ATP. And that, like you said, you know, if I don't have oxygen in that little energy production cycle, I'm going to produce two units of energy. Yeah. And if I do 32, you know, 16 times more energy. Like, again, I don't think we can really comprehend what that, no, feels no. like you know 16 times more energy and i think this is really important i work with quite a few people with chronic fatigue and they almost all without fail have really really poor yeah. co2 tolerance and i'm kind of exploring this hypothesis in my mind it's like are you just running on 16 times less energy than ever you know you're not delivering the oxygen your co2 tolerance is so low that you just blow it out before you can actually get the oxygen out of your blood and your body's just struggling to do what it needs to do, right? Stay alive, but it doesn't have fuel, no. right? It's burning dirty fuel and it's creating all of these metabolites that then cause, you know, this, I, I don't have any energy. Like, and when you talk to people with chronic fatigue, it's not like I feel tired, you know, it's like, no, no, I can't get out of bed. Yeah. I, I don't have the energy to run my body right now. And I, again, I don't think this is the only thing that's going on, but I think it's very interesting that if you can't, get oxygen from your blood to your cells, you can't produce energy efficiently. No. And regardless of what you eat, right? It's yeah. broken down, digested into the molecules that then can be turned into ATP. Yeah. And so that's really the equation that we want to kind of be focusing on is, am I producing energy at the cellular level rather than, you know, am I getting the right forms of energy from my food? So, so powerful. It's so powerful. So for those listening, Campbell, 
Um, should we do just a quick bolt score so people can kind of get an idea of where they are? And then maybe we'll just give a couple tips on how they might go about proving, improving that score. Um, it's a really fun measurement because one, it's sort of where you are, and it tells you, you know, how your nervous system is doing. Um, if your bolt score goes down, you'll notice that you can feel it. You'll start to become more aware. Like Campbell said, if he doesn't sleep well, a lot of stress, whatever's going on, you'll be able to make that connection. And um, there's some stuff you can do to raise that over time so that you're more resilient to stress. And it's just, again, it just brings more awareness to, no wonder I feel this way. This is because this is how I'm breathing. This is where I am with my CO2 tolerance. Yeah. So BOLT score refers to kind of body oxygen yep. level test. Um, I think it's an interesting name for it because we're really measuring carbon dioxide and not oxygen, but we'll leave it as its name. Yep. Um, we'll do this in a, a somewhat, not informal way, but because we do have a lot of people on here, um, I'll talk us through how we're going to do the test and I'm going to have a timer running on my side and I'm just going to kind of throw out levels at 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So what we're all going to do, so while you're listening to me speak right now, I want you just breathing normally. Okay, and so we're not changing our breath in any way before we do this practice or this test. In a moment, right, once I tell you to, I'm going to say take your last breath. It will be a normal inhale through the nose. It will be a normal exhale out through the nose. After I've exhaled, I'm going to pinch my nose and I'm going to hold my breath, right? And when I tell everyone to hold their breath, I'm just going to start a timer on my end. This isn't a competition. You know, it's not a measurement of how long can you maximally hold your breath, right? No one should be clenching their jaw or their fists and going blue in the face. That's not what we're measuring. We're measuring how long does it take until you feel I need to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to breathe. You know, there's a desire that's building up saying, I want to let go of my nose and I want to take a breath now. That's the number we're looking for. So when you feel that, okay, you're just going to kind of note, well, what's the next number that I say? I'll just be counting and take that as my bolt score. So maybe it's 12 seconds, maybe it's 25 seconds. So when you need to breathe, you let go and just listen for the number that I'm counting out. Um, and then we'll just talk about a couple of levels. You know, if your number is this, this is what you should do, or this is what it might indicate. So everyone kind of sitting in a nice comfortable position. Um, we wanna try and relax the shoulders and make sure the body is in a good comfy position. Just breathing normally in and out through the nose. And wherever you are in the cycle of breath, we'll all just kind of take a final breath in now. We're gonna breathe out naturally. And then we're gonna pinch our nose and hold our breath. And we're just gonna relax, right? We're gonna keep our body soft. So we're at five seconds. And we're just observing what's maybe building up. We're at 10 seconds. And when you feel a distinctive urge to breathe, you'll let go and you'll breathe, 15. 20 and so we're going to just keep going for some of you will have a higher tolerance 25 seconds and again we're not forcing anything just really trying to stay relaxed 30 seconds and just in light of time we'll kind of pause the test at about 35 seconds if any of you are still holding fantastic you know it's a great indication that your physiology is flexible and right now maybe you're feeling pretty good what's the number one thing I want everyone to understand before we kind of go through numbers, this number fluctuates pretty wildly. If you've just exercised, if you've just eaten food, if you didn't sleep well last night, if you're worried about what you have to do this, you know, it's going to be impacted. So I don't want you to hear, oh, my number is low, something must be wrong. You know, you might've just had a busy day. You, you might not have slept well last night. So the best thing people can do is, you know, wake up and measure this. You know, you just grab a timer on your phone or your stopwatch because hopefully your phone's not in your room, you know, and just kind of breathe in, breathe out, pause and hold my breath. When do I need to breathe? Okay, that's my number. And do that every day for a couple of days and you'll get an actual number. And then throughout the day, if you kind of measure this, you can go, yes, go and do the hard thing because my number's at its highest or mm, maybe I should kind of pull back a little bit because my number's lower than usual. You know, I'm five seconds lower than my kind of normal. Um, so when we're kind of, the numbers that I look for, if we're 10 seconds and below, right, it, I would find it extremely unlikely that you don't stuff, suffer with anxiety, maybe panic attacks. You've definitely got dysfunctional breathing mechanics. And this is not something that started yesterday, right? This is like, you've been breathing a certain way for likely years, if not decades. 10 to 20 seconds, Again, I, I'm pretty confident that there is some room for improvement of breathing mechanics. Maybe your diaphragm's a little bit tight. Maybe your rib cage is a little bit immobile. And so it's requiring you to breathe a little bit more frequently than maybe you need to. Okay. And so 
again, some improvements that can be made. 20 to 30 seconds, you've probably got pretty good breathing mechanics. You know, you're probably breathing with your diaphragm. You don't have a high respiratory rate. You probably, you know, fit for lack of a better description, physiologically. 30 to 40 seconds, we're starting to approach what I would consider, you know, gold standard. This is where I'd like most people to be, you know, and 40 seconds and beyond, cool. You, you breathe really well. Your physiology is very flexible. You've got high stress resilience. You've got the adaptability to deal with, you know, a lot of different forms of stress. And so for those of you that are down on that kind of below 10 or 10 to 20 is just kind of thinking, maybe I do need to address how I breathe, right? Maybe there are some bad habits that I've picked up over the years of sitting at a desk for eight hours a day. Of course, I'm going to breathe improperly, you know, or pregnancy, you know, or back pain or surgery or abdominal pain, you know? So there's lots of different reasons. I don't want people to think my number's really low. I must be broken. I want you to think why, like what, could be the contributing factor. I do work a desk job. Cool. That might mean I should prioritize a little bit of body work around unraveling the position that most of us spend a lot of time in. Um, and the part of this that I think is you know, a good insight to have is it's not as though we're going to go, I'm going to get to 30 seconds and I'm done. You know, yeah. the higher that number, the better, yeah. right? Why wouldn't we want more stress resilience and more physiological yeah. flexibility? You know, so when I kind of first delved into this world, my CO2 tolerance, I think, was about 18 or 19 seconds. Yeah. And when I kind of like was really working out, I was up at about 65, 70 seconds. As I mentioned, you know, lack of sleep over the last few months with our baby, you know, it's back down to about 25, 30 seconds at the moment. And so it's not like, oh, it's like, okay, I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing so I can rebuild that tolerance because it's been a difficult couple of months and my body's telling me. You know, it's been a difficult couple of months. Yeah. And so we want to give ourselves a bit of grace there yeah. and work our way back to, you know, a more optimal level of tolerance or physiology. This is so important, Campbell, because I think so many people, um, they don't have that information and they go and work out anyways, or they do a long fast, or they do some high intensity interval training or something that um, takes an already overly stressed body, although they weren't aware, and pushes it over the edge. And that's when we get sick. And now we're working against our hormones, against our physiology. Now we're depleting ourselves rather than going, okay, uh, I'm a little stressed out. My bolt score just dropped significantly overnight. I need to prioritize rest and recovery today. Maybe a walk, breathing through my nose is a lot more appropriate than sprints on a treadmill where I'm huffing and puffing through my mouth, taking my body into a farther, you know, further stress state. So such an important tool to have. And it, isn't it so interesting that again, you know, this, kind of a reductionist mind of, I know so many people that when they're overly stressed, whether it's at work or at home, they turn to high intensity exercise yeah. as a way, way to de-stress, right? And I'm not saying that that's wrong per se, but when we look at how physiology responds, is that the best thing? No, right now it's not, you know? Is high intensity exercise bad? Of course not, you know? If you've got the capacity and the tolerance to positively adapt to it, it's wonderful. Yeah. Great research on it you know but if you've had a stressful day your co2 tolerance is low and you go and smash yourself in the gym where you go and do the really hard workout because it helps you de-stress then yeah you'll get some of the endorphin release and you'll feel a little bit yeah. de-stressed yeah. but you've actually stressed yourself out way more <laughs> you know and so now i'm continuing to kind of perpetuate that imbalance or that you know dysregulation that's occurring in the body yeah i'm so glad you brought this up because most of my community you know, females and weight loss is a big thing or weight loss resistance is something that a lot of my clients struggle with. And there's this whole idea that I'm really stressed out. I need to just go on a run and burn this off. And um, when the body is overly stressed, cortisol is high, nervous system is dysregulated, weight loss isn't going to happen. It's not the priority. Surviving is the priority. And so this really is the difference. And I talk to my female clients about this all the time. This is the difference of whether or not you know, you're working with your body and with your hormones or against your body, your hormones, your physiology, which can feel really frustrating. So if you're struggling with weight loss, you're doing all the right things, start paying attention to your stress levels and then tailoring your exercise when you fast, you know, these other hormetic stressors with that level of stress, with that bolt score. Um, so Campbell, maybe two things, what are your, so I think there's probably a lot of people here who had a lower bolt score than they probably wanted. I know I, I still have two, I'm still working to raise mine. Um, what are, what are maybe two of your favorite ways to just things we can practice each day to raise that CO2 tolerance and get a higher score? 
Definitely. So let's give us one for each kind of, you know, influence. So number one being kind of the way that I'm breathing or my mechanics of breathing. That's absolutely going to come down to how mobile my diaphragm is. If my diaphragm is really tight, you know, I'm going to breathe with my chest and I'm going to offload more CO2 and my kind of sensitivity is going to stay there. So a really easy kind of exercise. I'm just going to come up so people can see, you know, the diaphragm is kind of this dome is let's actually get in and, and give it a little bit of a massage, you know, and some of you will be going, oh, this feels really tight and really uncomfortable, but the diaphragm should be really nice and mobile. You know, I can nearly get my whole fingers under there. My diaphragm obviously is quite mobile because I do this all the time, but just getting in and spending maybe a minute or two, giving the diaphragm just a gentle stretch and massage so that it has adequate range of motion to take a slower and deeper breath. You know, if I can take more air in, I don't need to take as many breaths, yeah. right? If I'm breathing out 15 times a minute versus eight times a minute, there's a different level of carbon dioxide. Yeah. So first thing we want to kind of address is the, the biomechanics and do I have adequate range of motion and function, you know, of my diaphragm. And then the second thing we can kind of use as an exercise to increase my tolerance or increase my bolt score is actually exposing ourselves to a little bit more carbon dioxide than usual. And the thing I love about this, right, this doesn't need to be a formal exercise. This needs to be understanding. So if you're going on that run, make sure your mouth's closed. Yeah. More CO2. You know, you're going to feel, it feels like I need to breathe. And that's how you know I'm in exactly where I need to be right now, you know, and modulating your intensity rather than opening your mouth. So slow down a little bit so you can keep, running or keep walking or keep doing the yoga or whatever it might be and breathe through your nose and feel that slight feeling of i want to breathe more yeah. we're actually seeking that out with this yeah. exercise that can be done by just gently holding our breath you know so the same way that we tested it today we breathe in out we pause so doing that you know but a little bit more frequently but making sure that i'm really calm when i do it so the co2 builds up and my brain's going oh, what's going on oh I'm relaxed. I'm sitting in a chair. I'm very, very calm. And so it starts to think, well, maybe this number, you know, maybe I don't need to react at this amount of carbon dioxide. So it lifts the ceiling a little bit, you know, things like slow breathing or even box breathing, if done the right way, will cause a bit more carbon dioxide to accumulate. So in all of these examples, whether it's exercise, formal breath work, gentle breath holds intermittently throughout the day, we're just wanting to let a little bit more CO2 build up because I'm usually breathing it out all the time yeah. and make sure that I don't react to it. So we don't want people holding their breath, and, <gasps> right? That was pretty stressful. And so it's just feeling like my body's noticing more carbon dioxide, make sure I stay calm, go back to normal breathing, yeah. you know, or slow my run down or finish the breathwork practice. Um, but the more I expose myself to a bit more CO2, my physiology is going to adapt to that. Yeah. So important. And that's probably one of my favorite benefits of increasing CO2 tolerance is the more tolerant we are to CO2, the more tolerant we are to stress. And there's such a direct correlation between people that struggle with stress and anxiety and how long, you know, their bolt score, how long they can hold their breath. So by increasing our tolerance to CO2, doing those mini breath holds, making sure that we're breathing, you know, through the diaphragm, loosening up the diaphragm, all of those things are going to help you be more tolerant to stress, which I think everyone is looking for tools to, to help up with that. Um, Campbell, before we announce the winners, um, I want to talk a little bit about, we covered so many different things today, and, and you guys can catch the replay. I'm also going to send this out to my subscribers um, because this information is, I mean, what we just covered, I, I think we have, a, you know, you have a tool to help heal trauma. You have a tool to help heal your nervous system. You have a tool to help know, you know, should I push or should I pull back? When we understand the power of our breath, it really is one of the most powerful tools that you can have to heal your body, to change the way you think and feel. And it's free and it's with you all the time. And if you take the time to learn and to practice, it will shift your health significantly. And this is coming from someone that has done so many different protocols, work with so many different experts, some of the best in the field. But this information that I've learned from Campbell is something I will always have. And being able to pass this along, I'm, I'm using a lot of what you taught me, Campbell, in a couple of my courses and watching people that have tried everything. I'm talking, working with the best practitioners, doing all the healing protocols. And when they start to learn how to use their breath, 
to heal their body and to heal their nervous system, they make massive strides in their health. And the cool thing is, is that, you know, with a lot of these protocols, gut healing, pro you know, maybe a month or two later, you start to feel better. But if you're practicing breathing on a regular basis, it's cumulative. I swear every day, you know, if I commit to 20 minutes of breathing every day for 30 days, each day I feel more calm, more regulated, less reactive, more present. I mean, it just, the benefits go on and on and on. And so, you know, there's, there's so many different, we're, we're, everyone's looking for the, the quick fix and the next best thing. Um, breathing is one of the most powerful ways to shift your health and quickly as well. Um, it's a lifestyle. Once you have those proper mechanics and that awareness and that understanding, every breath you take again is either improving your health or hurting your health. And it's just such a powerful tool. So I want to talk a little bit about Campbell, about your upcoming um, course for practitioners, the one that I took, the 12 week course. Um, again, I swear I could take that course once a year and learn more. And more. <laughs> there was so much goodness in there. I review my notes all the time and I'm like, wow, like there's so much value in this course. Yet at the same time, I think you could come in with a lot of, you know, knowledge, background, you know, PhD, what, whatever your schooling is. And I also think you could come in as, you know, your average person off the street that just wants to improve their own breathing and be able to teach other people to do the same. Um, so it, it really, there's something in this course for everyone, whether you're super advanced in your, you know, health, whatever your practice is, or you're just wanting to learn how to improve your own breathing. Um, will you talk just a little bit about it, Campbell, kind of what it entails and when it starts? Yeah, I'd love to. And if you want to come and do it every year, you're more than welcome to come back, <laughs> join it again. Um, you know, it, it's really, it's the course that I wish I could have taken, yeah. you know, when I started my career as a health professional. I've been a physio for 10, 11 years now. And the information that's in this course that, you know, has taken me years to accumulate and collate and synthesize into what it is today, but it just completely changes the way that I work with my clients and patients and the tools that I can provide them. And it's really a tool of empowering the patient or the client, you know, breath work is not something that someone can do for you, but if I can provide you with the understanding of how it's going to benefit you and you kind of pick up that practice, you will reap benefits. And like you said, immediately and cumulatively. And so the program is, is really kind of tailored towards those that work with clients um, or that want to work with clients and that perhaps already work in health. You know, maybe it's a yoga teacher, maybe it's a movement specialist, maybe it's a psychologist or therapist. I, I really have quite yeah. a broad um, array of clinicians that want to come in and understand how can I empower my patients by teaching them to breathe better. Um, and the point that I always like to stress, you know, and I know you feel the exact same way about this, right? There's a big difference between breathwork methods, you know, and this understanding of how breath influences your nervous system, your physio, you know, the function of breathing, rather than a little tool that is very, very important and very powerful, but they're two different things. And this book is much more about people understanding, how can I help restore someone's breathing mechanics? How can I restore their physiology and stress tolerance? How can I help them regulate their emotions through breathing protocols, rather than I'm gonna teach a breathwork class, you know? You can do both. Um, so the next course I, I run usually three, sometimes four cohorts a year. Um, so this might be the last one this year. I might try and run one in October. Um, starts July 3rd. Okay. Runs for 12 weeks. We cover 12 modules. And it's really split into, you know, understanding the functional side of things, the therapeutic side of things, and then kind of the, the business side of things. Like how are you going to go and share this with people and impact your community? Because I've got kind of a selfish goal. You know, I, I really want to help 100,000 people breathe better and live better. And I can't do that by myself, right? I can equip clinicians and practitioners and professionals to go out and spread this with their community. Yeah. That's going to spread like wildfire, you know, and I think just when people breathe better, they feel better and they treat each other better. And it's, you know, just this nice big ripple effect. Um, so after that 12 weeks, there's an additional kind of 12 weeks of support where, you know, this supported kind of integration, that's when most people are going to have questions. So my intention behind it is I really want people to come out of it with confidence, with competence and with clarity. You know, I know who to help, how to help them and how to go out and share this with people. Um, and so over six months, we kind of really work on building the knowledge foundation, the application, and then kind of working on how is this, you know, how are you sharing this and, and how can we kind of get it in front of more it's people? So good. I, I, I agree with you. We need so many more people talking about this because it's one of those things that is so simple. We all have it. It's free once we learn how to use it. And it 
shifts things quickly and profoundly. And I think it is, I know you find Campbell, I think it's the missing link for so many people. I feel like, you know, all these, everyone's moving toward nervous system health and nervous system regulation, because we know that's why we're not healing. We're all stressed out. We're spending too much time in fight or flight and people are doing so many things. They're in therapy and yoga and they're meditating and they're stimulating their vagus nerve and they're only getting so far and they're frustrated. And everyone's looking for that thing that is actually going to allow them to be able to heal. And I just, again, it's for so many people, it's learning how to use their breath to calm their body so that it can heal. Yeah, and, and it's just a tool that is so versatile and, and applicable in so many different fields which is why i kind of you know i was a little bit of a pd junkie you know i was like what's the next course i could do until you know that all stopped when i found breathwork because so i'm like this is this is what i was looking for the whole yeah. time you know i've been posting about this this last couple of days like whether you're someone that works with people with anxiety or back pain or energy issues or sleep disruption or emotion you know breath can be applied in those fields you know with incredibly effective you know it, it's just it, I, it, it's sometimes hard to articulate, like how can it be effective in all of these different fields? But again, kind of, you know, you and I, when we talk about the nervous system, understand that that is this kind of like undercurrent and it's this driver for whether it's, you know, healing and transformation or staying stuck and in that survival state. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's applied in so many, like I've got people taking it into schools. I've got people working with postpartum moms, people working with, you know, the high stress CEOs yeah. and it's the same set of core principles once we understand those it's like i can take that and apply it you know to the yeah. athlete to the new mom to the kid um because we're all breathing yeah it, it's this kind of universal constant that if we do it better we feel better it's so amazing and i have taken i can't even count how many courses and certifications and i mean i'm just a forever learner and your course campbell i mean even even after i finished it right away after i finished it, i thought i'm gonna take this again this was so good i even want to go deeper and know more because I'm just so hungry for what is going to help people and help them a lot and help them quickly because we don't all have the time or the resources. And I think part of my work is taking the things that are going to help people the most and putting those in front of them so that they can finally heal. Whether you know, it's, you know, again, there's so much out there. People are so overwhelmed and I just, I love helping people. Where should I focus my time and energy breathing? is one of those things because it is so powerful for all of the things. Campbell, you talked about chronic pain. I think there's like, I mean, the chronic pain epidemic is, it's insane. When we calm the brain with our breathing by calming the nervous system, we feel significantly less pain. So even if you haven't healed that injury or whatever it is, when we're in this heightened state, we feel pain on a, like such a different level. So just by calming our physiology, all of a sudden our back pain of, you know, 20 years melts away. It's just, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. So Campbell, thank you so, so much. I would give anything if we could have like millions of Campbells in this world, because this <laughs> learning in school, we need to be hearing from our health practitioners. When we go into a doctor with chronic pain, anxiety, depression, yes, you know, take this, treat the symptom, but let's address the cause. Let's change the way that you're breathing so we can really get you well. Let's get you off these medications. You don't need all of this when you learn how to use the tool that we all have. It's so powerful. So thank yeah. you for doing I mean, I'm incredibly grateful. Conversations with you always kind of light me up and reaffirm like why this is so important. So I very much appreciate that. And like you said, you know, I think we've been sold this idea for a really long time that it's the thing out there, you know, it's the medication, it's the diet change, it's the stuff out there that we're seeking that we're being sold instead of this internal, you know, shift that, that I can change internally how I feel and how I perceive and how I experience. Like that's going to be far more impactful than these external shifts that we can make. And that's not to say that they aren't both important, yeah. you know, but one precedes the other if I can shift myself into a state of receptivity and growth and adaptation, you know, then all of these wonderful tools that are out there, they have more impact on me. They, they work better, you know, versus again, this idea that I'm fighting my way towards health and I'm pushing, you know, it, it's just, there's a limited efficacy of that. Yeah. And so I, I think breathing serves this incredibly important purpose. And there's, I'm so happy to see this kind of like wave of attention that it's getting right now. 
but part of that is I really want people to understand that, you know, it's not a, a trend or it's not this wellness fad, you know, no. how you breathe really impacts yeah. your wellness and, and how well you yeah. can live your life. And that's what I want to kind of share with people and share that with practitioners that can share it with yeah. other people. And yeah. yeah, so I appreciate that, you know, the platform and these beautiful wide ranging conversations that we get to have. Me too. Me too. And for those listening, you're probably hearing Campbell and I talk about all these benefits and whatnot, but um, take the time to learn and to practice because once you feel what we're talking about, you're going to get so fired up too. And you're going to end up like <laughs> wanting to tell the whole world about this tool that we all have. And it is so unbelievably powerful. So if you're listening and you are interested in teaching this work to other people, or if you just want to become a you know, expert in breathing yourself, please consider um, Campbell's course. The 12 week course was the one that I took. It's a little bit longer than the, obviously the five week course, which is what we're gonna give away here in a minute. Um, but it truly takes you through everything you need to know about it. And, and then it, you know, it's, it's not what we know, it's, it's how, you know, can we teach this to other people? Can we teach it to even our loved ones and our family and help them improve their health? I have had so much fun just teaching my close friends and family of people that I really love how to use this tool because again, it shifts things so quickly for people. So if you're considering it, check out Campbell's course. And then Campbell and I are giving away two of his five week course. What's in that course, Campbell, just briefly. So that's the, it's kind of a, a fundamentals of breath work. So a lot of the concepts we talked about today, you know, breathing mechanics, physiology, nervous system. Um, it's a, it's an introduction in this first kind of, you know, gateway to understanding your breathing a little bit better. So it starts with kind of like, a breath awareness and building awareness of your breathing and then some tools and strategies to improve your mechanics, improve your physiology and regulate the nervous system. And then it kind of finishes with a, a little bit of a, how do I apply this on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay. And so the self-paced course over five weeks, people can move through a little bit faster if they choose to. Um, but I've kind of structured over five weeks with those pillars. Okay. I've known a lot of um, my community members that have taken it and said it was just the perfect amount, like they knew enough that they could find, they kind of take that information and start to practice breathing, but it wasn't too overwhelming <laughs> for the average person. Um, so the winners of both of those courses are um, Wellness with Gabby and then Naturally Amber White. And I will put your guys' handles in the comments so you can um, get a hold of Campbell and-, and Yeah, and if both of you just reach out to me, you send me a message and I can send you over the link to get started on the five week course. And that five week course includes a, a one to one call with me so that we can kind of personalize what we're learning because that's one of the big things, you know, you can go on YouTube and type in breathwork exercise, yeah. but how are you doing that exercise? Like we discussed in depth today, the way you take the breath really influences how you respond to it. And so for anyone that, you know, for those that didn't win the course, um, it is available yeah. um, just on my kind of link tree. You can go in and find it. And there is a one-to-one -one call. So we can make sure that you're applying it and it's relevant to yeah. you. Campbell, thank you so, so much. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> thank you. And, and straight back at you. I, I really appreciate I love these conversations. I you too. It really is some of the most important information out there. You're just one of my favorite practitioners to talk to because this information is like, ah, I just, we need to get it out there to so many more people. So thank you for doing what you do. Well, thank Thanks for helping on the mission. Yes, take care. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.